rules. In a knife fight, no rules. <laughs> This video is a Q&A with Sean Cassidy, the son of Ted Cassidy. This is the first time he had ever dressed up like his dad. So we decided to bring out around 35 minutes of the Q&A for anybody out there who wants to see it. We really enjoyed it, so if you're a fan of the Adams Family, I think you're going to like it. of the upcoming biography about Ted Cassidy, Lurching Forward, please give a warm Philippi welcome to Christopher Cook. Listen, you and I both know you didn't come here to see me. You came here to see someone else. Ladies and gentlemen, as the son of Lurch, this is Sean Cassidy. Put your hands together. So what we did while the trivia was going on, Sean and I were back behind the scenes here and I had just gotten the idea a few weeks ago. <laughs> this came together quite quickly, I think. And I, I was talking to Sean on the phone and I said, now listen, before you say no, <laughs> let, me, let me throw something at you. What would you think if we actually went ahead and made you up as the son of Lurch? I actually said Lurch and then he corrected me and said, well, Chris, that would be the son of Lurch, and I think that he's correct on that. Everybody okay with what we see here? You know, I'm always amazed when people ask me, that, that's how your father looked? No. He, he was in that chair uh, every morning for about three hours to get that look with the makeup artist. So that's how long it takes to turn somebody into that kind of look. All right. Chris did it in about 15 minutes. He, he's a makeup artist extraordinaire, so I'm happy about that. Well, thank you so much. What was one of your favorite memories of you and your dad? Wow. I have to sift through a lot of memories for that. Uh, dad was, he was a wonderful dad. We were best friends. We did everything together. And I guess my favorite times were the more of the quiet times. Because when I would go out with Dad, of course, <clears throat> there would be throngs of people all over him, and that was to be expected. So the more quiet times at home. So a lot of those times, and I'm trying to think, I'll go with this. Late at night, often, Dad was a writer and a wordsmith and uh, loved language and putting all that together. And he instilled that in me and, and taught me that as well. And we would sometimes sit on the couch and open the dictionary to a random page and talk about every word on the page, <clears throat> what it meant, how to pronounce it, the etymology, the history. We'd spend 10 minutes on a word and then move down to the next word. It sounds strange, but I had the best times doing that. We would laugh and, and be serious and studious. It was very a very fun time. He, he, he was just great. I enjoyed every second. In terms of the character Lurch, and you and I have talked a little bit about this, but uh, what was it like to be on the set of The Addams Family to your memory? Because that is some time ago. Uh, what can you share with us about that? <laughs> it was a, I mean, I was seven years old. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, Dad had a little dressing room in the back of the sound stage. The dressing room you got kind of depended on how well you were known. So Dad had a little kind of hole in the wall uh, dressing room in the back. Uh, uh, John Aston played Gomez. His dressing room was actually out of the studio across the alley and up some stairs. Whereas Carolyn Jones, who was really the star of the series when it started, she had this huge dressing room in the middle of the sound stage, so I remember that. But Cameron and I would hang out in Dad's dressing room, 
And uh, when they start filming, there's a red light that goes off in different parts of the soundstage so everybody knows to be quiet and not move. And Cameron and I would wait in the dressing room, wait for that red light, and then we knew the donut cart was unguarded. <laughs> so at that moment, we would snake out quiet because it was near to be gather the stuff and get back in there and eat to that. That was, to me, you know, I was seven years old. That was my favorite part of being on the set. Uh, but it was fun to watch. They all got along so well. They really had fun. There was a loose feeling on the set. They were all creative, fun people. So very often the director would have to cut the scene because they would go off script. Uh, I'm sure you all know the, the times that Gomez would uh, start kissing Morticia's arm after she spoke French. Well, as you can imagine, sometimes John Aston would go a little overboard on that scene and the director would say, cut, and everybody's laughing. And uh, there were a couple of times Dad would walk in and supposed to say, you rang, and he would say, oh, what would you like, Mr. Adams? And he'd do this, <laughs> just do this cock, you know. So they did a lot as they improvised, and they had a lot of fun. It was loose and fun on that set. When the Adams family came to a close, we know that it ran for two seasons, and pretty much in conjunction with uh, the Munsters. Uh, but do you at all recall when uh, the show was canceled or how your life changed clearly yeah, i'm assuming well, you, he your dad had more time with you guys right after that <laughs> yeah although it, acting is tough i mean dad made a living at it but it is tough even those who uh, do well still you, you have a job and it ends and now you're sitting by the phone hoping it rings and you have another job and he did but it was a little nerve-wracking uh, the Adams Family in particular was canceled over the summer, so it was not while they were filming. There was nobody there uh, on, the, on the stage and in the studio. Uh, so there was nobody there to collect anything. My understanding is that crew and cast members of other shows who were there came into the Adams Family soundstage and took all the props. So, for instance, I, I'm sure you guys know that uh, Dad played Thing, and so we always thought it would be fun to have one of those boxes. I think there were three of them, and they were none available. They were all gone. I saw one uh, sold on uh, Sotheby's auction site several years ago for over twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> would have been nice to have one of those. Um, so uh, yeah, after it stopped, uh, Dad had to find stuff, but. Uh, being the size he was and the voice he had and the acting skill that he had, he found a lot more work. Um, a lot of them were guest appearances. It was hard in Hollywood, even to this day, to be a leading man if you're over 5'10". So being six foot nine made it a little tough. He actually, most of his work was voiceover for the Hanna-Barbera cartoons, a lot of big commercials. Um, so he, he did okay, but uh, he did live by the phone a lot, I remember that. And actually that informed me, uh, because I had opportunities and maybe maybe some skill to, to go into acting myself, but I watched Dad when I was a kid and thought, boy, maybe something more predictable would be more comfortable. <laughs> uh, I'm an attorney by trade, now I can't say that that's necessarily more comfortable, uh, but uh, th that's how that went. I am just so thrilled that uh, Sean is sort of stepping into this new sort of enterprise and coming out to, to join us and to, uh, to sort of carry on the legacy that, that his father created. Yeah, I had long wanted to figure out a way to continue the, 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 the character, the spirit, uh, the, the love that a lot of people have for the character and for Dad, and wasn't really quite sure how to do that. Um, but it's looking more and more like people are interested in hearing from me and uh, my life. It really means a lot to me. It, it does. Um, I love this town. Go ahead, do too. But, by the way, Sean Cassidy is as nice in person when you get to know him as he is uh, out here. You guys are going to really enjoy talking to him. I uh, wanted to also ask you, now, after your father's uh, work in the Adams Family, you know, one of my favorite movies, of course, is Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about I, certainly that famous scene? I think my favorite story about that, about his career, about his acting career, I have more favorite stories about him being a father. Uh, but 
in his roles. Okay, so he was doing Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and he was out in Colorado and Utah and Arizona, some of those places, you know, in the, the, the Western-themed uh, um, areas. And uh, I was in school, I didn't get to, I, go out, I went out there a couple times, but when they were filming this particular scene, I think you know what I'm talking about, um, I was not there. He wrote me a letter, and I've got to find it. I think I still have it. He said to me that they were worried about the scene because Paul Newman, who kicked him in this scene, uh, and Dad talked about the scene, and they decided they're both professionals. They want this to look as realistic as possible, so what are they going to do? Well, Paul's actually going to kick him. So how are we going to do this? So they decided, and they did, wrap a pillow around the upper part of his thigh, and the idea was that Paul would hit him on the pillow, and of course his foot would slide up, but he would just take one for the team. Well, Paul missed. And it was a direct hit. And he told me that look of anguish on his face was real. Uh, <laughs> so, I just love that story. There's some commitment to your craft, right? <laughs> I love it, Harvey Logan, right? Harvey Am I right? Logan. Yes. Um, also, you know, it, it, and he made some appearances on uh, Star Trek, uh, as well as Lost in Space, uh, sci-fi, and a few horror films. And I'm trying to think of uh, the Hanna-Barbera cartoons we had talked about. He played nearly every villain you can imagine. Every villain in the 70s was his voice. They loved him down there. And Dad loved doing voiceover because... He, you know, he was tall, and so when you're tall in Hollywood, you got he called them, he had a category for the kind of roles that he often got, he called them seize them roles, because often his character said, seize them, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, and so he, they, and he didn't want to do that necessarily, he, he was a trained actor, he wanted to, he often talked about he wanted to play Cyrano, Cyrano de Bergerac, that was the kind of thing he wanted, and he didn't get opportunities like that a lot. Um, Fantastic. I know the other thing that we love is uh, the the trivia about the Incredible Hulk, which came, of course, uh, at the end of his career. And uh, just love listening to his incredible voice as he introduces that. And that is, and I think that's one of, one of the trivia questions, that that was one of the, the roles that sort of carried over after his untimely death and that uh, we were still able to have that booming uh, wonderful voice of I call it gravel and honey almost yes, yes, a little that's bit different than Vincent right. Price I, I describe him in a different way but um, and also the grunting and groaning uh, yeah, that Lou Ferrigno was, acted, but that was Ted Cass. Was very voice. Fun. So I went with him on several of those occasions where he did the voiceover for the Hulk. And it was interesting. It was always at night, and there was nobody there. There was like one engineer in the booth, and Dad, uh, not really necessarily with a script, because it was a lot of grunting, but the big screen up, and there the Hulk is doing a thing. His dad is... Rah, 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 you know, and I'm watching him, and that's all he's doing. And they're saying, you know, cut, good take. I said, how do you know that that's good? <laughs> but, but he loved that. One thing that he really enjoyed about voiceovers, what I was getting at a little earlier, is that when you're doing voiceover, it does not matter how tall you are. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what you're dressed in. I went to some of those Hanna-Barbera sessions, and here are these creative, wonderful actors sitting around the table doing their voices. And again, they're, they're loose, and they're having fun, and 90% of what they did wouldn't be allowed on the air because they were just having fun going off script. And, and he loved that. Um, you know, he wanted to be the on-air actor, but he felt the freedom at that table uh, being the voice actor. And as you know, that voice, like, when I came out here, I, I, I grumbled. I did not say you rang, because no one can do that. James Earl Jones, Morgan Freeman, Jeremy Irons, they can't do that. He was the only one on earth. And uh, so he, he was able to use that voice in, in a lot of great ways. You had uh, mentioned to me uh, what a wonderful young life this was for you growing up in Pacific Palisades and that for you, um, correct me if I'm wrong, it just seemed normal that everyone's mom and dad were yeah. in the movies. Back in the 60s, uh, Pacific Palisades, Rustic Canyon was 
upper middle class. Now it's insanely elite. I don't even recognize it. I don't necessarily even like it there much anymore. But at that time, it was uh, just some wonderful people, really an artist enclave. Um, there were actors, directors, musicians. That, that, that was the place they hung there and, and in Topanga Canyon. And um, so we'll see about that. Uh, oh, for instance, I think I mentioned this. Halloween was very fun in that neighborhood. Uh, we would always make sure to go to Mel Blanc's house early. Because he, he was great. He would stay at the door and he would do voices and improvise little things. Like as long as you stood there, you think eventually he would say, all right, time to move on. Let's, 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 uh, no, if you stay there, he would just keep performing. That was fun. And that was that area back then. Uh, just fun. Everybody was nice. And I walked. It was a mile and a half to school and home, and then nobody worried about that. It was just, you know, it was the time. Which still exists in Philippi. What I think of as safe and, and wonderful and just uh, nice still exists here. Or at least that's what I experience. You know, I, I guess I've only been here a handful of times over the last 50 years, but every time I come, I feel that. I walk around the last couple days, people stop on the street and talk to me. It's so nice. I, I just, I love it here. I know I said it before. I, uh, the, there was one woman, I wish I could remember her name, who said to me, maybe you're here today, uh, who said to me, welcome home. And that struck a chord. I don't live here, but it does feel like home. And, and I love that. We were talking about, uh, you know, growing up with uh, famous parents. And, you know, your, your dad, of course, became good friends with people like Noel Marshall and Tippi Hedren. Um, did a lot of the famous people that your dad uh, befriended and became friends with, were they somehow de facto aunts and uncles to you and Cameron? Did they sort of, John Aston, for example? Sure, extended family. Uh, a lot of Hollywood personalities don't always enjoy going out in public, as you know, because they don't always get their privacy. People come up to them. So sometimes they band together. Some of the gatherings and parties would be Hollywood people because they, they understand. They understand the privacy and the, the public part of it. So absolutely it was that way. Creative, nice, warm people. Uh, of course, some of them had big egos. How can you be a big actor without having a big ego? But uh, it usually worked out pretty well. Yeah, very nice people. Yeah, have great memories. And your dad had to do quite a bit of traveling, presumably, for his job. So right. I know that he was shooting uh, perhaps some... Uh, Chris Robinson films in the mid '70s uh, in Georgia and Florida, yes. different places like that. Mm -hmm. Were you? Was he ever able to bring the kids along with him, or did you guys just have to stay home and kind of wait for him to come back? If we could, we would go. I, I traveled a lot with him. Um, I had a couple of stories I should not tell. Uh, <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> No, I no, won't do that. Nothing. Uh, <laughs> I love you, Dad. Uh, yeah, we, we, I went with him a lot. But I mean, I was pretty young a lot of that time. You know, he, he passed away when I was uh, 21 in college. Um, so, you know, it really wasn't long after high school that, that, that he was gone. So, I you know, didn't have as much opportunity as I would have liked. But, uh, yeah, we traveled. And it wasn't just for the, the acting jobs. He did a lot of promotions. Back in those days, opening up a bank and cutting a ribbon, you might hire Ted Cassidy to do that. Uh, so we would go to sometimes to some very interesting small town kind of things that were, were also a lot of fun. So yeah, he did a lot of things across the board. How tall are you? Well, I'm now 6'6", six, six, I'm sorry to say, because I used to be 6'7". Uh, and I guess that's the way those things go. And uh, it's interesting to me that people think I'm tall. I don't think of myself that way. My father was 6'9". My entire life, I, you know, I was looking up. And uh, so, and also, he grew up here. I guess he was much taller than most people and felt that way and felt a little odd about it. And uh, for the longest time, he wondered and worried if I would feel self-conscious about that. I never did. I had a father who was taller, 
and I played basketball. A lot of my friends were similarly tall. I grew up in Los Angeles, big population. So, uh, yeah. Does anyone have a biting question that you just have to ask Sean Cassidy? Any questions? You'd have to raise your hand and have a... I, yes, ma'am. That looks like Marissa back there. It is. I'm asking this for my mom. My mom was wondering if you were friends with the actors that played Wednesday and Pugsley when you went your dad. Good, good question. Good question. Yeah, Lisa Laurie and Ken Weatherwax. Uh, Lisa was more my sister's age, so they hung together a little more. And uh, Ken was more my age, and we hung together a little bit. Uh, what was wonderful about those days was on the studio lot, there was a guard at the front entrance, and that was about it. Once you got in there, you could go and do what you wanted. So sometimes, Ken and I would walk around, uh, for instance, next door was the Beverly Hillbillies, across the alley was Mr. Ed. And I remember one day we walked over and the door to the Beverly Hillbillies set was open. The red light was not on, we walked in, there was nobody there. All the props were out, we just looked around. But you know what the flip side of it is? We didn't mess with anything. So that all worked. Uh, I guess, you know, times are different now. Uh, but that was a lot of fun. Ken and I used to skateboard around uh, the, the, the studio. And uh, that was a lot of fun, so. Yeah, did. did you go out to the cement pond? <laughs> <laughs> did not. <laughs> you had a question. Yes. Is it true that your dad really wore a 17 shoe, 17 size shoe? Interesting you ask that. No. 16. I wear a 17. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> so for me, that was kind of a, an achievement. I, I wasn't taller than my father, but at least I had a bigger shoe. So. <laughs> Other yeah. questions. Those are great questions. Now he was a 16 triple E. Wow. Okay, so I am a 17 D. So there you go. I'd make of that what you will. He has just a few things at home that his dad used or wore. Tell us about a couple of things that maybe you have. You know, in in, uh, in junior high school, I used to wear the shirt he wore, which had the French cuffs. So when they were unrolled, it was literally like this much below my hand, and he used to wear that just for fun. Um, the smoking jacket from the uh, Mother Lurch Comes to Visit episode, I used to wear that to school. I don't know where either of those items are, but I still do have the bow tie. Not this one. I left it at home. Uh, but I have the original ABC Adams Family bow tie and uh, really enjoy that. And you, and you think that you've uncovered a couple of socks that he wore, a pair of socks. <laughs> I do. I have a pair of green socks. See, I, th I think these things should be, like, mounted, framed with a little gold plate. Um, I put... Yo, yeah, that's right. Green socks. But they weren't in the show, so... Uh, okay. uh, actually, maybe my most uh, treasured possession of Dad's is I have his fraternity paddle from Wesleyan. I have that. My, uh, my daughter's sorority paddle and my father's uh, fraternity paddle hang side by side in my office. Uh, I love that. How do you feel about modern adaptations of some of your father's more famous roles? For instance, in the new uh, Adam's Family Show Wednesday. <sighs> <laughs> I'm sorry. All, all the lurches since Dad are kind of one-dimensional. He... The, if you know the Charles Adams original cartoons, oh, and the Charles Adams estate and Charles Adams at the time had a tight grip on that show. They couldn't do anything without his approval. Uh, that's the way the show was set up. Every, from, from the graphics to the, the set to the characters, he had to okay everything. And uh, the, those of you who know that cartoon, Lurch was bent over, hence the name Lurch, and uh, never spoke, never grunted, had no, no voice of any kind. So when Dad was brought out for this audition, the director was explaining to him how, what the character is and how he should portray the character and said he should you know, bend over. And Dad said, no, I won't do that. And the guy said, what? This is your, you just moved to Hollywood and this is your first audition and you're saying no to the production company that wants to employ you? All right, so he almost got fired right there, but instead they, they did the audition, 
And uh, so one of the audition scenes is they pull the rope and he walks in straight up and he had no lines and he said, you rang and the place just broke up. Everybody laughed and from that moment on he had he had lines, they, they uh, fashioned storylines around Lurch that he, in that moment, he elevated Lurch as a character in that show and in the Adams Family to something that, you know, we all know about now. Felix Sila was his name. And that was, so it was an adult yes, adult. yes, right. And don't you have parts of the costume? I have two pieces of that costume. I'm not sure why. Uh, I don't know. It was in a box in our closet for a long time, and uh, only two pieces were there. It was it was fashioned in several pieces, um, and the most iconic piece, of course, are the glasses from which hung some hair. And I have that piece and another piece, and it's in a bag in our garage, I think. <laughs> I have to find that. Do you have a question over here in the purple shirt? Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, as you were growing up, did he ever bring the family back to the Philippines? Yes. Where he grew up? Yes, in 1974, he was filming a, a film called Poor Pretty Eddie with Leslie Uggams uh, in, uh, in Georgia, near Athens, Georgia. I guess University of Georgia is there, right? And we decided, I don't know, I guess he thought, well, as long as we're near, <laughs> that we'd rent a car and drive to Philippi, and we did. And uh, that was fantastic. So I know I've told this story before, but I love it. So we came in, it was raining, we came in kind of late. We came in you know, from the north and came in over the, the, the covered bridge and pulled into what was a tiny little gas station. I guess it's Sheets now, is that what it's called? Um, but it was a little gas station there, and we pulled in, and you know it was 10 o'clock, so the entire town was asleep. <clears throat> and uh, so we pull in. There's nobody there. Dad's about to leave, and I'm looking, and I go, Dad, that looks like it's unlocked to me. Sure enough, the gas pump was unlocked, and, it, and and it was on. And we filled our car. We put some money under the door. Came back the next day to make sure it was taken. But that just informed everything about this town how people feel about life and each other and just i fell in love that moment that that was great yeah. so uh yeah we came back uh visited uh, my grandmother emily i don't know if some of you might remember emily cassidy she was a house mother up at the college what was your dad's favorite role that you were part of other than lurch I would say his favorite role is something nobody saw because he didn't like the seize them role so much. He did a uh, one man play in uh, Cambria, California, kind of dinner theater. Uh, I, I forget what it was exactly, but some Shakespearean thing where he, he did the whole thing by himself. That was more what he wanted to do. So I don't know if that was his favorite. But I'm sure it was among his favorites, and it was the kind of role he really more wanted to do. Hey, when, when will you move back here? When will you move back here? <laughs> well, I moved back here. See, I love that. I never lived here, but the idea that I would move back because I am home. I love that perspective. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll be back. It's so lovely. I have such a good feeling as I'm here. I, I know we'll be back. I, who knows when. Uh, hard, hard to say, but let's just say soon. What can we expect from your table? Sean's going to have a vendor I'm table. I'm going to have a table. We're going to have some, some memorabilia of dads. And, and I want to let you know, tomorrow I'll be dressed as Sean. Um, so tonight, as long as I'm dressed like this, anyone who wants a picture, anything like that, I'm, I will hang out here as long as you want. And I think that would be fun, because I don't know how often I'm going to look like this. I'll be taking bribes at the end of the evening, so uh, I'm from Los Angeles. I can't <laughs> is, is Sean really qualified to judge the Adams Family costume? This is how tough it is in Los Angeles to be uh, to, to try to do this kind of thing. When Dad was doing Star Trek as Ruck, uh, we had the costume at home. We had the skull cap, uh, the, the robe, and all of that. 
And I was in the first grade uh, in Santa Monica Elementary School, and they, before Halloween, they had a costume contest, and Dad did me up as Ruck. I mean, the professional stuff, it was professional Hollywood, and I did not win. How is that possible? And we realized we were kind of new to the area, you know, this, this is how Los Angeles is. Okay, the competition is stiff. Is there any Thank you, thank you for asking that question. Um, it's almost as though you're a plant out there. Almost. Uh, it's my wife, Christy, over here in the blonde hair. Beautiful woman. Her son-in-law, Mark, is with me. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> yes, actually, I'm kind of on a crusade. Uh, I'm sure you've seen a lot of this, or a lot of YouTubes, a lot of articles and things that talk about dad and, and you know the medical condition what happened to the end and a lot of people attribute that to gigantism right a condition that that uh, uh, many people suffer from Andre the Giant uh, Richard Keel uh, and there are a lot of articles written about that's what affected dad it's not true it was some weird article out of Australia many years ago that claimed that I don't know why there's no no medical information, no basis for that, but people, I, I guess it's sensational or something, uh, gather interest and people write that it's not true. So I'm trying to put that, I, I went to a new doctor a few years ago and I just met this doctor and I'm in his office and I see him writing stuff down on his chart and he writes down that condition. And I looked at him and said, what is that? And he says, well, you, you're six foot seven. You, you must have that condition. No, that's not true. But one of the things we were talking about uh, is thing. And I had mentioned that, yes, you can find some documented evidence that thing was named thing, T, thing, uh, at the end of some episodes uh, of The Addams Family. But also, uh, Sean corrected me, I thought it was only uh, assistant director Jack Vaughlin, who was playing the hand part when Ted could not. But uh, Sean yeah, Mercy, you were misled. I'm sorry. <laughs> my my understanding, and I was uh, there. It's my fault. <laughs> and I was there for a couple of these. Sometimes it was John Aston. Sometimes it was a director. Sometimes it was a crew member. It was really who could do it. And, and what I love about Thing, and, and again, it kind of harkens back to what I was talking about how he, he loved doing roles that didn't really uh, rely on his size. Thing was just the hand. And that, that, that hand was an actor in the show. And I remember him at home in front of the mirror practicing, figuring out ways that his hand could communicate and emote. And uh, if you watch the, if you watch Thing, he's very expressive. And if you watch Thing and Lurch in the same scene, it was before the days of split screen or CGI. You can, if you concentrate on, on Thing, you'll see the hand is smaller and not as expressive. Uh, and, and so he really enjoyed doing that. And again, occasionally they'd go off script, and Thing would all of a sudden reach out and grab somebody by the throat or <laughs> the cot. <laughs> Is it true, too, Sean, that uh, your dad would, on occasion, switch from the right hand to the left hand just to see if anyone noticed? I have not heard that before. I, this is but what I, I would heard. not be surprised. I heard that this is... It might is... also depend on, like, he had to, had to, to uh, kind of crouch down under that table. It might have depended on, the, on how that would work and not being seen by the camera and all that. Another uh, misinformation thing that I get all the time is people come to, I loved your dad in Moonraker. No, no, that was Richard Keel. Just in case any of you wondered that too. Uh, that's a, that's and, a common misconception. And I forget the actor's name, but also sometimes the, the gentleman from Superman 2. I know somebody remembers his name. I think his first name is Jack, but... Uh, oh, yes, no. No, that's not, <laughs> that's not Ted Cassidy. That's, I, I uh, am done conferring. There's somebody who uh, knew your grandmother and would love to tell you some stories and things oh. get a little quieter. Okay, um, but, I would yeah. love to hear that. Yeah, yeah, so... Um, are there any last minute questions? You'll still have time to talk to Sean for a bit. Um, and by the way, Emily was awesome. I, you know, some grandchildren and their grandparents get along. 
Emily and I were also like best friends. We went to movies together, walks together, late night philosophical talks. She was so great. Great to my dad, great to me. I just love her too. Ladies and gentlemen, on that wonderful warm note, I think I'm going to go ahead and say this was a success. I thank you all for coming out. And let's have a big round of applause for Sean Cassidy. Thank you very much. Really, really appreciate it. Let me shake your hand, Sean. There you go. There's for the cameras. I think very good. Um, and I appreciate Sean coming out and letting me spill powder all over his black suit. He was wonderful about that. All right, I'm going to have some pictures, and I guess we're going to just open it up and be sort of down home here. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this video with question and answer session with the son of Lurch, Sean Cassidy. It was a pleasure getting to meet Sean. He's so friendly. He just seemed so down to earth and just very humble. I also enjoyed hearing all the stories about his father. And we hope that Sean shows up on some of the comic cons around the country. I think people would enjoy hearing his stories and his great love for his dad. So if you like this video, give us a thumbs up and subscribe. Yeah, so until we meet again, J&B have, have left, left the, the building. building.